Compiler Construction 13. So last time uh, we covered going from R to X um, uh, in uh, adding you know, heap allocation and garbage collection. Now we actually need to focus on what we need to do in the runtime system. So recall that the way that you are actually you know, compiling your program is you're doing something like the following. You're doing runtime, sorry, cc runtime.c, and then your x program, which is an assembly list thing, and then you're outputting that inside of the binary. And inside of your runtime, right now, you probably have a function that's called readint. And this uh, you know, is what happens when you call read. And you also have printint and print bool. So these three functions are the exports from runtime, and they're really simple. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be expanding these quite a bit. Um, these, by the way, yeah. And the x.s, what it does is it just exports main. Okay. And these functions don't call main, but main calls these functions. Now, what we're going to change this to is we're going to get rid of printint, and we're going to get rid of print bool. Instead, we're just going to have a generic function, which is going to be called print value. Um, the other thing that we're going to do uh, is we're going to make it so that we export some concrete values. And you know what? I think that um, it's going to be good to actually write out what the C types of these things are. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to decide to think about this differently. So I'm going to erase these. And what we're going to do is we're going to write down all the functions and then who exports them. So I'm going to put in, um, I'm going to put a C here for things that you implement in your runtime. And so you're going to have an, you know, int 64 T function called readint that takes no parameters. You, of course, are going to have, you know, in your X program, you're going to have a function that um, returns uh, an int and it's named main and takes no parameters. Um, you're also going to have in your C program a function that um, is going to not return anything, void, and it'll be called print value. And it takes as an argument a pointer to a type. But now we are going to represent types as just numbers, because remember, like, you know, unit is zero and so on. So it's going to take a pointer to the type, and it's going to take an actual concrete value. Now, right here is a little bit of a, um, we might have to tweak this a little bit inside of our type. So uh, right now I'm writing it as if it's an n64. Technically, it is um, an integer that is the same size as a pointer. I believe this is called int pointer. Let me just do a quick Google to uh, verify that that's what it's called. I think it's called int pointer t. called int pointer t. Um, because the thing is, is that uh, if the value uh, turns out, sorry, if the type turns out to be a vector, then that means this value is really a pointer to whatever the vector is. Okay, your C program also is going to export the free pointer, which is going to be an int 64 t star free pointer pointer. We also need to know an int 64t from space end. This is the thing that um, we look at to determine whether or not a um, whether or not a uh, allocation will succeed. And then finally we have an int 64t star of the root stack pointer. The root stack pointer. 
Okay. There's a little bit more that we need. Our C program also is going to export um, a function void that is called initialize. So this is the thing that's actually going to initialize the um, initialize the heap. Our C program is going to have another one uh, that's called collect. And what collect does is collect guarantees that um, the free pointer will be a certain distance from the from space end. So it doesn't return anything. So it returns void, it's called collect. And it takes in the pointer to the current root stack. So we'll call it the root stack top. And then we also have a 64t allocation request. So this is how much memory we want. Okay, now these are the things that are all required. Now there's a few little helpful things that I found uh, when writing this program that uh, I highly recommend you do. So the first one is, where do the values of these types come from? What we could do is we could make it so that they're just hard-coded inside of our compiler and they're hard-coded inside of the runtime. I don't really like having something being hard-coded in two places. So what I like to do is I actually like to make it so that the compiler is entirely responsible for determining which numbers are which types. So the way I do that is I actually make it so that my um, assembly code exports a bunch of int 64 t's for you know the type of unit, the type of a bool, the type of an s64, and the type of a vector. Now you may not know how to make it so that your runtime code gets to look at things that come from the assembly. And the way that you do that is in your C program, you just stick extern, uh, and with no quotes, extern in front of that definition. So if you just write at the top of your C program, extern int 64t and then this thing, then now the runtime will be able to look at those things, but it'll assume that they come from the other files that it's linked to, the other objects that it's linked to. Okay, here's another thing that I recommend doing. I recommend making it so that your C code exports a character, which is just whether or not you want to enable debugging, and where debugging means printing out stuff. And then make it so that your compiler has an option for it debugging. And then what you do is you make it so that when you're compiling, if the debugging option is turned on, you know, you like print out stuff for the debugger. But what you also do is you generate code that sets this variable um, inside of the main function so that now the C runtime will be affected by it. The thing, the reason that's nice about this is that it'll make it so that you can debug specific parts of the specific cases in the compiler rather than having to modify the runtime, recompile and all that stuff um, uh, for whenever you want to do a debugging change. So again, you don't really need to do this, but this is my personal advice about how to do this well. All right, so among all of these functions, you know, we've talked a lot about main, we've talked about you know, read int. Um, these things are just numbers, you know what I mean? Just export, you know, quad one, two, three, or whatever. Um, this is really what the type generation stuff does, um, you know, the debugger. So the things I want to talk about are print value, initialize, and collect. Those are really the, the interesting components. So let's talk about print value because it's easier. So print value. By the way, I just wrote up here, you know, 13 too. Okay. So let's let's conserve space. Alright, so we got print value. And it takes in a pointer to a type and then a value. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to do something like this. We're going to say something like if when we look at the type 
and we look at, and you know, we dereference it, we look at the thing, is that equal to the type of a unit? If it is, then we don't even need to look at the value. We know that we can print this out as, you know, unit, and then be done. Otherwise, what we can do is we'll then ask whether or not it's a bool. And so we'll say, you know, sorry, if type zero equals the type of a bool, then in that case, you know, we'll print out true or false. So we'll do something like, you know, printf of a percent C, and we'll say if the value is true, then we'll do T, otherwise we'll do F. And then boom, now we just printed out both. So we got ints, bools, and then so, you know, we'll have another case for if it is an integer. So tie best 64, and there we'll do printf of percent D, and then the value. Okay, so hopefully these are all pretty obvious. Now the next thing that it would be would be a vector. And so in that case, we'll say, is this thing a vector? And this is the more interesting case. So basically what we're gonna wanna do is, you know, maybe what you'll do is you'll like print out vectors as being in between parentheses or something like that. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make it so that it gets, things get printed out as if they were an R program that would generate the value. So in that case, I'm gonna make it so that my units get printed out with you know, parentheses and I'm gonna change this to S and have it print out true and false. And the idea is that I'm gonna make it so that when you run print value, you get something that is a program. The reason why I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna make it so that uh, my testing apparatus is gonna read it in and then call the interpreter on it and then see what the value pops out is. I don't have to write like a separate parser. Okay, so the way that I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna say, well, printf um, and we'll print out vector space, all right? Then what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna print out the values. So here's the way, here's, here's the way it's gonna work. We know that, that, uh, that this type was a pointer to a vector thing, which was one of those you know, quad labels that we gave. And we know that it starts off with, um, it starts off with first the, um, the fact that it's a vector, then the length, then each individual element. So what we'll do there is we'll do printf, sorry, we'll do a for loop, where we'll say for the integer i from zero, up to what? Up to i is less than the type one. So we'll look at the second thing after the type, and then we'll increment i. And then inside here, what we'll do is we'll do a printf, uh, printf. Actually, you know what? I think that uh, you know, I just I'm just a pedantic for beauty. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so that the parentheses, sorry, that the spaces come here. So now what I'll do is I'll print out a space, right? And then what I'll do is I will call print value. And I want to give it what the next type is. So the next type will be the type of two plus i. And then what the value is, is we'll treat value as if it is a pointer, skip over the type tag, and then add one to it. We'll close that, and then we'll end by printing out the closing parenthesis for the vector. And we'll close the if statement, and then we'll close print value. Maybe we can have another case where if it's not unit bool or S64 vector, then we'll error and say something terrible has happened. Okay, so this is print value. This is probably the most interesting part. It's a, um, it helps you understand what the structure of a type is. It starts off with the size and then each one of the types of the elements. Okay, now let's look at the initialize and collect functions. They're gonna be more interesting. 
So, um, the style of garbage collection that we're going to do is stop and copy. Because stop and copy is the most convenient, I, I find it to be the simplest kind of collector. Most people, I think, think that mark and sweep is the, is the simplest, but I actually personally find it complicated to deal with managing the free list. The bump pointer is very easy. And we know that we've chosen that way because of the way that we wrote allocations in the compiler. All right, so our initialize function, void initialize, its job is to allocate memory and set up the global variables um, that are relevant for memory. All right, <clears throat> so basically all we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to set, uh, there's, we're going to have a global variable that's going to be called the from space begin. And we're going to set that equal to malloc of the heap size. And what we're going to do is we're going to set the from space end equal to the from space begin plus the heap size. Then we're going to set the free pointer to be the from space begin. Then we're going to set the root stack begin equal to another call to malloc. And you need to decide how big you want this to be. The easiest thing to do is just make it the same size as the heap, which by the way is absurdly big, right? Like you're, normally the stack is considerably smaller than the heap, but there's not really a good way to decide how big to make these things. And then we'll set the root stack pointer to be the root stack end. And all of these, by the way, are all global variables. That's why there's no variable declarations on them. This right here is an int star pointer, int star point, well, really a char star pointer, a char star pointer, a char star pointer, a char star pointer, and a char star pointer. Now, what do I recommend the heap size to be? Uh, my advice is to make it so that your, you know, your size t of heap size just started off as a megabyte. So that would just be one left shifted 10. That's the easiest thing to do, just make it a megabyte. Oh, sorry, that's 1K. Um, a megabyte would be you know 20, or maybe you could do like 16 or something like that, but you know, start off small. Okay, whatever, you'll experiment. Now, if you want to be really cool, then what you can do is that rather than using malloc, you could instead use mmap and what's the difference between malloc and mmap? Basically, when you call malloc, you're gonna your your program already manages um, a data region because you know what a process starts and it has a stack and a data region, um, and so uh, malloc is gonna get space from the data region. But what you might like to do is you might like to call mmap, which will give you individual pages. Now, why is an individual page desirable? Well, if you get a whole page, then you can use mprotect to mark a page as being like write only or read only or something like that. So what I would recommend doing is if you use mmap, um, and yeah, so if you use mmap, then also use mprotect. And basically what you do is what you'll do is you'll allocate a page and then some more pages and then you'll allocate one more page. And this right here is the heap size, the heap size. But then allocate extra pages on either side and then mark these as no read, no write. No read, no write. And each one of these things is a page. MMAP allows you to um, MMAP allows you to get individual pages. Um, now, by marking them as 
being um, by marking them as being no read, no write, that means that if you accidentally make a mistake in any other part of your system, you'll get a trap immediately rather than reading arbitrary memory. So it's kind of a way to protect yourself. It's basically a way of um, forcing a segmentation fault uh, when you read outside of the boundaries of the heap as opposed to just getting weird behavior. Um, so I recommend doing this, uh, especially if you want to learn more about, you know, memory management and Unix system calls and things like that. All right. Okay, now last is uh, collect. So collect is, of course, going to be, you know, the hardest part. Um, and we'll start off by going, by just reviewing quickly the stop and copy algorithm. Um, and then we'll look at some of the, like, the key components of how collect is going to work. So stop and copy. Okay. So, um, when you do stop and copy, um, you have um, you have your heap somewhere, and we refer to your heap as the from space. Let's call this the from space. This right here is the from space begin. This is the begin. This right here is the end. The whole size is the heap size. And then somewhere in the middle of it is the free pointer. Okay, so this is what your memory looks like. Now this region beforehand is made up with objects like object A, object B, object C, D, and E. Now, all of these objects are going to be vectors in our system because um, everything that's not a vector is stored in an individual word. So that means that the contents of B um, are either pointers to other vectors or numbers, but B itself is always a vector. A is a vector, C is a vector, D is a vector, E is a vector. Um, values are not what are called boxed. Now, of course, I've dra drawn the free pointers happening in the middle. But when collect actually gets called, it's going to be very close to the end because the whole reason that collect has been called is because you have an allocation request that cannot be handled by the, um, by the available free space. Okay, now inside of this from space, this is the actual physical layout. But in addition to that, there um, we can think about the graph structure of the um, of memory. So what I mean by the graph structure, what I mean by that is that each one of these objects, object A, object B, object C, object D, and object E, they are vectors with you know pointers inside of them. So like let's imagine that vector E uh, was the numbers one, two, and three. In that case, it doesn't have any pointers anywhere. But maybe D is a true and then a pointer to E and then a pointer to B. So that's possible. Similarly, object C might be a 5 and then a pointer to E and then a pointer to D. And then maybe A is a pointer to B and an 18. And then what's B? Let's say that B is a, um, a 0, a 2, and then a pointer to D. So this is what memory might look like for a particular system. Okay. Now, what else do we need to know about? Well, the other thing that we need to remember is that there's the root set. Now, in our program, the root set is only made up of the things that are on the root stack. And what are the contents of the root stack? The contents of the root stack are any vector 
that is live across a call. And remember, one call could be a call to the collector, meaning that, in sense, in sense, um, since we merge uh, the live sets on either side of an if, uh, that means that every time we do allocation, every time we try to do allocation, there's a chance that we might call the collector, which means that all the other vectors are live across that region. So that basically means that vectors are almost certainly, unless they are produced and then consumed entirely before there's another allocation request, they're probably going to be in the root set. So <clears throat> in theory, let's, let's write over here the root set. In theory, the root set are all global variables, global variables, um, pointers in the program source, and the program source, and then local variables, that's stuff on the stack and registers, and registers. Okay? That's what theory would say it is. These global variables, and so if you remember from like OPL, um, if we think about the CEK machine, the global variables and the pointers in the program source, they're inside of C. The local variables that are registers, they're inside of E. And then the local variables on the stack, they're inside of K. But now, for us, we don't have global variables, and we don't have pointers in the source. And what we have done is we've arranged for all of them to be in the root stack. Now, what does the root stack really look like for us? So what we have is we have the root stack begin, and it is a region of memory. Okay, well, sorry, this is the root stack begin. This right here is the entire root stack space. This is the entire root stack. And then somewhere in the middle of it, right there, is the root stack end, or I think I called it top. That's the argument to collect. See the collector, it has this argument, the root stack top. Okay, now inside of this region, they are individual vectors. So this is vector 0, vector 1, vector 2, vector 3, and so on. And this, by the way, is a region of memory. Okay, whatever all those things are. So that means that if we think of this as being what the heap looks like, those are, you know, the, the request to alloc that we've done. In addition to that, there's the root stack, or we'll call it the root set, and that means that there might be other objects, like there's another object, let's call it x. And x is an object that has 1, 2, and 4 in it. And then there's y. And I'm going to put these off as kind of their own thing. Okay. Then there's y with 8, 10, and 11. And then let's say that there's z. And z, it has a pointer to a. And then let's say that it also has a pointer to e. Okay, so this is what memory really looks like from the collector's perspective. So now what we need to do is we need to take this region of memory right here, look at it by looking at the root set and this heap graph, and figure out what objects we can preserve and which ones we don't preserve. Now, effectively, what we're going to do, let's, um, let's copy this right here, copy that, we'll go to the next page, we'll paste it,
And then this is 13.5. 13.5. Okay. So now what we're going to do is inside of your collector, by the way, your collector, when it runs, you know that there's no sp that, that you're out of space. You don't have to check that. You know that you can't do any that you can't um, that you can't satisfy the allocation request until after you do it. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna create a new region of memory that's the same size as the as the old heap. Asterisk right there. What you might do is you might make it so that every time you do an instance of stop and copy, you increase the stacks, you increase the heap size. Um, my, the, my personal advice for how to do this actually is what you'll do is when you do a, when you call collect, make a heap, make a new heap that's exactly the same size. And when I say make a new one, I mean like call malloc or memprotect or whatever. So you, you allocate this new region of memory that's exactly the same size as before and you copy things over. And then if after that you still don't have enough space left, then increase the heap size by two and then run collect again. That's my advice for what to do. That way you'll um, you'll you won't like drastically expand the amount of memory that you use very fast. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to look through each thing in the heap set, sorry, in the root set, and we need to find the things that are referenced over here. So in principle, what we need to do is we need to say, ah, x, what does x point to? It doesn't point to anything. What does y point to? It doesn't point to anything. What does z point to? Aha, z points to a, so I need to copy a, and it points to e, so I need to copy e. Then I look at A and I say, aha, it points to B, I should copy B. Then look at E, it doesn't point to anything, don't need to copy anything. Then I look at B and I say, aha, it points to D, I need to copy that. Then D needs to copy B, which has already been copied, and E, which has already been copied. And now I'm done. Thus, I didn't end up copying C, so I freed some space. So what will happen at the end is that the code, the memory will look like we'll have A's space, then we'll have E's space, then we'll have B's space, and then we'll have D's space, and then we'll have the space from C has been reclaimed. And then after we go through this process, then we can free the old region of memory, and then we don't, we don't need it anymore. Okay, so that's, that's what we'll do. Now, there's a few questions that we need to ask which is, you know, like, how do we know, like, it really, how do we know what something points to? Well, the thing to remember is, like, what is the layout of a vector? So the way that a vector is laid out is that first you have a pointer to its type. That's the first thing. And then what you have is you have, you know, value 0, value 1, value 2, and so on. And now what is the pointer to the type? Well, let's look at the type layout. The type layout, which remember we just looked at for the printer, is that we have I am a vector. Okay, then it says how many. Then it has type 0, type 1, type 2, and so on. So basically, the way that you know what kind of thing A is, is you just look at its first spot. Now, when I say the first spot, I mean, that's what you're actually pointing to, right? Z is pointing to A, which means it's pointing to that thing. It is pointing to a type. So the thing inside of Z is pointing to a type. And because it's pointing to a type, we can just look at that and we can say, aha, what are you? This is the reason why we had to allocate extra space, so that the root set would be able to tell what the things it's pointing to are. Not what the type of Z is, but what the things it's pointing to are. Okay, now once we know what its pointer is, we can now say how many things there are. That tells us how many things we need to look at. And for each one of those, we look at the corresponding type, and we say, is this thing a vector, or is it not? If it's not a vector, we don't need to care about it. We just copy it blindly. But if it is a vector, we need to know that it contains pointers. And since it contains pointers, we need to trace those. This process of tracing uh, is called scanning. Um, the way that you think about 
the scanning process um, is, is that, hmm, what's the right way to say this? Okay, so there's two like interrelated parts. Part number one is copying something from the old region to the new region. We're going to call that NQ. Because what we're going to do is we're going to have a queue of objects that have yet to be scanned. So we're going to, and then what scanning means is looking at an object and finding the things that it points to. So essentially we're going to start off by scanning the root set. And then when you scan, that causes things to be enqueued, and then uh, you scan those things. So if we think about the structure of stop and copy, um, it's like this. Um, scan root set. And then what scanning does, this is, this is all of collect. Really, there's a few things more that it's like make new heap. Okay, make new heap. Okay, so you make the new heap, then you scan the root set, and then what does scan do? Scan walks an object and queuing the things it points to. The things it points to. And then while the queue isn't empty, What you do is you scan queue members. And then when you're done, you free the old space. Now, what does in queue do? And queue copies from old to new. Okay, so these are the three interlinking parts. Collect, this is, this is how it works. There's really nothing more to say about that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk in detail about what scanning and enqueuing looks like. Now, one thing to think about is like, where is this queue actually stored? And here's kind of a really cool thing. We can actually use the new heap itself as the queue. So here's the way that we think about it. So we have this new region of memory, that's the two space. It has the two space begin, okay? Inside of that two space begin, we have the two space end, and this whole thing is heap size. Right? And inside there somewhere is the free pointer. Okay. Then what we do is we have a new another variable that's called the Q the Q head. And it is pointing to an object. So there, there's object A, B, C. D, E, and F, and G. Okay, so what this means is, is that we have already scanned A and B. We start off by scanning the root set, which doesn't go in the space, and what scanning means is that it walks across it and we enqueue the things it points to. So we look at the things that it points to, which in this case would be A and E, and we copy those into the queue, and so the Q head is still pointing at the beginning, but we've copied them in. And where do we copy them, by the way? We copy them to where the free pointer is. The free pointer is the end of our queue, because after the free pointer is memory that we haven't done anything to. So then what we do is we look and we say, is the Q head equal to the free pointer? If it isn't equal to the free pointer, then that means the Q isn't empty. So that means we have to look at the thing that's at the Q head and call scan on it. And what that's going to do is it's going to look at A, and it's going to see what things it points to. And it's going to enqueue those, which is going to leave the queue head where it is, but it's going to bump the free pointer up as they get allocated. Then once we're done, what we do is we just advance the queue head and look at the next thing, and then we'll scan B. And we'll keep doing this until we get to the point where the queue head equals the free pointer, and then we're done. 
Okay. Now, in the process of this, one of the things that we need to worry about is what about the situation when we scan Z, we copy in A and B, then we scan A, we copy in B, we scan E, which doesn't copy in anything, then, um, oh sorry, sorry, we scanned A, copied B, scan E, doesn't copy anything, then we scan B, that copies in D, then we scan D, and D is going to try to copy E, and it's going to try to copy B. We don't want to get new copies of those. We want the old copies to stay, stay alone. So the way that we do that is with something called a forwarding pointer. A forwarding pointer. And we can break down what it looks like like this. So before we've done the copy, and remember copying happens inside of this in queue function, we have some object that's, for example, at address 28. And it's pointed to by object, by another object at address, let's say, 0, and yet another object at address 90. So what does that look like? What that looks like is that in the from space, Let's call this object A, yeah, object A, B, and C. So we have object A, and it exists at address 28. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me just fix up some of these things. Uh, this one is an A. Let's make it so that Let's make it so the object that is being pointed to is x, and the first thing pointing to it is a, and the second thing pointing to it is b. I think that's a little bit more clear. Okay, so at address 0, we have object a, and it has inside of it, literally inside of it, is the number 28. And then at address 28, we have x. Then at address 90, we have object B, and inside of it is a 28. So that means that both of these things are pointing to that spot right there. All right, now, what do we do? By the way, and in the two space, there's nothing. So the first thing that we do, step one, is we copy x. So the way that we copy x is we move it over into the two space. So after that step, our two space is going to have object x, and let's just say that everything, uh, you know, moves like by hundred or something like that. So it goes to 128 and that's where x is. Okay, now what we do is once we copy it, step two is we update a. The reason that we're updating a is because we're just assuming that the reason that we're even scanning, that, so we're assuming that we are scanning a. So if we're scanning A, then that means we're enqueuing from A. So that means that we're going to update the thing that told us that X isn't even existed. So we're going to update our from space so that at address 0, we have A, and it's now going to point to 128. B is still going to point to, one, to normal 28, and X will still be there at 28. Okay, but this one is going to point to the new x, and this one's going to point to the old x. Okay, what's next? Step three, what we're going to do, is we're going to change 
old x, that's 28, to a forwarding pointer. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the from space so that at 0, we have a and 128. At 90, we have b and 28. And then at 28, it's going to say 128 now. So that means that this is a pointer over here, this is a pointer over here, this is a pointer to there, and this right here is the two space where we have at 128 the x, the two space. Now later on what's going to happen is that we are going, by the way, let me just put in here step zero. Step zero is, is that we scan A, so we're scanning A. So then what happens? Is, is that at step four, we scan B. And scanning B causes us to try to NQ 28. Just like up here, causing scan A, sorry, scan A caused us to try to NQ 28. But what we do is when we try to NQ it the second time, we look at it and we say, aha, that there, that's not a pointer to a type. That's a pointer to something that is in the from, the, something that is in the to space. Therefore, I know that I should update B. Update B. So that now B will have 128. Now, I realized kind of after, when I was halfway through this, that uh, I made a mistake. The only reason that we would possibly be scanning A and B is because they're actually already in the two space. So these things, like A really is something in the in the two space that is pointing back into the from space. And so is B. B is in the two space pointing back into the from space. So what ultimately ends up is that everything is in the two space where we want it to be. Okay, so now let's talk about those two individual functions, NQ and scan. Um, let's do scan actually first because it's easier. But they're interrelated with one another, right? Scan calls NQ. Okay, so this is 13, 13, 8. Okay. Scan doesn't take any arguments. Well, I mean, I guess it kind of does. Yeah, it, it takes the thing that you want to scan because remember we have to scan the root, the root set originally. Okay, so we'll, it has an int 64 t star object. This is the object that we're gonna scan. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the tag, which is the first thing in the object. That tag, by the way, is just another way of saying what the type is. So maybe we could really say, we could really call it type. Okay, so that's the type, but it's really the type pointer, right? So anyway, and we know that that type pointer must be a vector. So because we know it must be a vector, we know that it has a certain number of fields. So we'll do for each one of those fields, i is less than uh, type 1, i++. plus plus. So now we're going to look at each one of its fields. Then what we can do is we can read off what the element is. So the element is equal to the object 1 plus i. So that's the actual value of this type. Then we can look at the tag, or sorry, the type of that object. So then we can look at the element of that type, which would be the type 2 plus i. Then what we can do is we can say if the element type is type vector, then what we'll do is we'll call nq on the pointer to that object. So the pointer to object 1 plus i. 
Notice that we actually don't really really need to do that. We don't we don't really need to know what the element is. We only need this part right here. Okay, so we'll close that, close the four, and then what we do is we'll update the will we yeah. So when when we're scanning an arbitrary object, this is all that we do. Um, but when we're also scanning the um, when we're when we're specifically scanning things on the queue, then in that case, what we do is we update the queue head um, by you know plus equal um, the type of one plus one because we know that type one tells us how many things there are, and there's also one more for the tag. Um, and so that's how many things that we need to skip over. Okay, so this is how scan works. Okay, now let's look at how NQ works. So in Q, what it does is it takes as an argument a pointer to where, so this is a star and then another star, it's the object reference pointer. So this tells us where this object is being pointed to by. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna compute the new location for it, which is going to be the current Q tail, which is the free pointer. Okay, that's where this thing is going to end up. Then what we can do is we can figure out what the actual object is the actual object, we can read off what it is by reading off the object reference pointer. Now that object is itself a pointer, so we can read off what its tag is by looking at object zero. Then what we can do is we can see if it's a forwarding pointer or not. So if the type itself is inside of the two space. And how do you know if it's inside of the two space? If it's between the two space begin and the two space end, that's how you know if it's in the two space, then that means it must be a forwarding pointer. I'm gonna write forwarding, okay? And if it's forwarding, what we'll do is we'll remember that the size is zero because we didn't actually allocate any space and what we'll do is we'll set the new location to be the type because we're not going to actually do any allocation because uh, it was already moved otherwise what we'll do is we actually have to do the copy and when we do the copy we can literally just do a mem copy so we can mem copy the source goes first, I believe. I actually always forget whether it's source or destination. You should check. So the source would be um, the object. We're copying the object, and we're copying it to the new location, and we're copying an amount corresponding to the size. And you know what? We can actually, yeah, let's, let's not use a mem copy. Let's just write it out in kind of the boring way. So what we'll do is we'll say that we know that the size is equal to the type one plus one. And then what we'll do is we'll just have a little for loop. And this for loop is gonna say that um, it's gonna set new location i equal to object i, and it'll just go through each thing inside of the size. And then what we do is we just advance the free pointer by the size, and then we have to update the pointer. So we have to say that the object reference pointer, object reference pointer, is now going to be equal to the new location, whatever that is. And then we're going to set the object itself, that's the old object, the thing that we just copied, we have to set it to the new location. This is what actually installs the forwarding pointer. So this updates the old reference and this installs the forwarding pointer. And that's all it is to actually implement stop and copy. There's a lot of you know ideas and interconnected pieces, 
You know, you need to have all three of these things interlocking in tandem. My uh, guess is that when you do this the first time, uh, it's not going to work. <laughs> so one of the things that you would want, what you will want to do, is you want to make it so that you can basically like print out every single print out, print out what the heap looks like um, before you start doing collection. And basically have a way to like walk through every individual point. You know, you could even like build, you know, use like a breakpoint or something like that. So you can step through and watch what the heap does. Because it's really hairy to make sure that you, you know, install the forwarding pointer, look at the object, all these things. It's, um, it's very subtle code. You know, it won't be very long. It'll still only be like 50 lines of code or whatever. Um, but it's painful to get right. All right. So with that, we have now finished... Uh, heap allocation and garbage collection. What we're going to do next uh, is we're going to do um, adding functions and closures to our to our language. And at that point, I mean, pretty much everything else that you could ever want to do to your language is just busy work. Um, at this point, we really have like a full-fledged language after we do functions and closures, but it's going to be a lot of pieces. So, see you next time.